Okay, um, so welcome everyone. We are excited to have everyone here today. Um, I am Hewan Gurma. I'm an assistant professor of African American and African Diaspora Studies. Um, and I would like to welcome you all to the third and uh, unfortunately last conversation in the Ashby Dialogue series on the Indian Ocean Currents at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. The Ashby Dialogues are founded on the late Warren Ashby's vision of community of inquiry, a collaborative knowledge production between students and faculty in and beyond the classroom. This is a series, uh, this series is part of the work that Nilofar Kadir, uh, myself, Yohan Gurma, and Omar Arli are undertaking as part of the broader interests of the Ethiopian and East African Studies Research Network founded in August 2019. Our aim and cultivating this inter multi and transdisciplinary series is to explore the cultures, histories, and significance of Indian Ocean worlds with an emphasis on their relation to the global African diaspora. We have invited colleagues at different stages of their career to build relationship between tenured senior colleagues and early career scholars. And we have focused on those scholars who are located um, locally to us in Central North Carolina because we believe that thinking from our South especially on the grounds that of a minority serving institution such as ours, offers an important contribution to the discourses on Indian Ocean worlds and South-South relationships. We would like to thank the Ashby Dialogues Committee for funding the series, as well as the departments and programs of African American and African Diaspora Studies, International and Global Studies, and English. We also would like to thank the Lloyd International Honors College, um, so for ensuring a smooth webinar experience, we thank Amanda Shipman in IT and providing logistical support during and after events. We thank um, graduate students, Elena Macarion um, and Amy Vaught as well. A few remarks about our event. Um, our format is four moderated questions followed by an open conversation with attendees. So please use the chat um, to share who you are, your interests, where you're joining from and direct all comments and questions for the conversation period via the Q&A box and let us know if you're willing, be willing to share on mic. If you are, we will invite you to unmute your mic when we get to our question or comment. We are also welcome to enable a um, live transcription for the event. The recording of this event will be made available with a short delay to all registered participants. Okay. So let me do a short introduction. Um, of our three speakers um, for today, uh, three panelists for today. Uh, first, we have May Joseph, who is a, a founder of Hartman Theater Incorporated, an environmental theater company focusing on global water issues based in New York City. She is professor of global studies in the Department of Social Science and Cultural Studies at Pratt Institute in New York. Joseph has written widely on transnational cultural flows and works on water ecology, global environmentalism, visual culture, and critical ocean studies. She is the author of a number of books, including most recently, Ghosts of Lumumba, uh, Poetic Slab, um, Sea Log, Indian Ocean to New York. She has also co-edited uh, co several volumes, such as Performing Hybridity with Jennifer Fink, Coloniality and Islands. Um, Joseph has created site-specific decolonial performances along Dutch and Portuguese maritime routes. Okay, welcome. Uh, next, we have Mira Ray White, um, is an uh, who is an assistant professor of art history at Appalachian State University. Her research has addressed the development of fingerprinting in colonial India, the architectural history of British colonial prisons, and the role of remunerative labor played in the role of colonial Indian uh, peniology. Her research has been funded by the American Council of Learned Societies and the University of California Presidents Program. She has held postdoctoral fellowships with the Mahindra Humanities Center at Harvard University and the Interdisciplinary Humanities Center at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Currently, Waits is uh, currently working on a book project, Colonial Carcerality, The Birth of the Modern Prison in India, which explores the spatial history of British colonial prisons in India. And last, we have Nilfar Kadir who is an assistant professor of English and International Global Studies. Currently, she is working on her first book, tentatively titled Afrasian Imaginaries, Global Capitalism in the Indian Ocean Worlds. 
In addition to her scholarship, she co-translated with her parents Ngugi wa Ntiongo's uh, short story, The Upright Revolution, into Urdu for Jalada, Africa. Her teaching and research interests include post-colonial literature and theory, Indian Ocean Studies, and histories of global capitalism. So welcome to all of our uh, panelists for today. So to open up our discussion, uh, I have a series of questions for you. Um, and I will remind you to please keep your responses short so that we have enough time for Q&A at the end. So for the first question, um, please describe some of your current and recent scholarly and teaching projects and how you understand that work to be in engaging in Indian Ocean Studies broadly conceived. So, May Joseph, let's start with you. Thank you, Hewan. I, I just want to start by saying thank you so much, Nilofa Kadri, Hewan Girman, Omar Ali, for, and the University of uh, North Carolina Greensboro for inviting me. And I was just saying, I was just so excited to be able to converse with people who, are, who understand where the Indian Ocean is. So this is such a privilege. I've also been part of the other sessions you've had. So for my talk, I'm going to be a little bit more anecdotal and um, maybe show some images as well. So thank you, Hewan, for the question. And I, I, I want to start by saying the reason I was so excited to, to talk in this session on aesthetics and cultural studies is because um, in the 30 years I've been, um, you know, I, I mean, I've been here since 1985 in the United States. It's been, and I, I, I got my PhD in theater. It was so hard to find a way to bring the Indian Ocean into my life uh, because I was from the Indian Ocean, but in the United States, uh, the work here in the arts, whether it's visual arts or performance, is, is, is really according to sort of American ethnic studies model. So it's Black, Asian American, Latinx. And the Indian Ocean, which is this multi-layered um, series of maps, uh, is this, there's no easy way to, um, to, 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 to bring it into the conversation. And I, I want to, re to spell out the maps for that. Uh, one is that if you think about the Indian Ocean, it's not just the Indian Ocean itself and it's literal that shapes Indian Ocean aesthetics, but it's really the early colonial maps, which is for instance, a Dutch, Portuguese, German, English, um, Italian, uh, in the case of the Ethiopia Eritrea region that mapped the Indian Ocean in, a, in, in, a, in, a, in the 15th century. Uh, before that was the Chinese and the Arab influences in the Indian Ocean. And then you have the Cold War between the 1947, 1975 mapping, so for me, for instance, I grew up in Tanzania in the revolution. So my residences were Soviet and Chinese and Vietnamese, and my parents are from communist Kerala. So for me, it was the connection between communist Kerala and socialist Tanzania, but in conversation with Vietnam and, and China and Russia. So uh, with the Soviet uh, uh, models, and for me, the Bandung moment was my influencing um, uh, map. So when we talk about aesthetic, I, I, you know, the syncretic Afro-Arab Asian aesthetic of the Indian Ocean is is really what uh, encapsulates for me uh, a teaching pedagogy. So um, maybe I could leave it there, but I had a couple of images, but I'll do that in the next stage. But I just want to say that, that the reason this idea of bringing aesthetics and cultural studies together is so important is because, it, you know, I, I, I came of age in the, in the academy in the US in the era of the Birmingham School, but it took me studying the cultural studies of the Birmingham School through Stuart Hall's work to understand that I was shaped by the Makerere School in Uganda and that I came of age at the time, and you know, the Makerere in the 1960s and 70s were very influential, very influential in East Africa. And so people like Mandani and the, you know, uh, Ilife, and there were these Marxist scholars who had shaped my, my ideas. But when I came to the US, I couldn't find a way to, you know, back to that moment. It took the Birmingham School for me to understand that the Makerere School, the subaltern studies of India and the Birmingham School, well, this was my intellectual milieu into asking a question through American cultural studies. What is for me an American cultural studies? So it's a very complicated map of an Indian Ocean pedagogy in the US. Is that good? Yes, thank you, May. <laughs> Mira? 
Uh, well, again, I'd, I'd like to echo May and thanking everyone for having me. A special thanks to Dr. Skadir, Ali, and Gurma for organizing these events. It's an absolute pleasure to be a part of the conversation and kind of following in this third uh, conversation. The other two have been fantastic. So I'm an art and architectural historian. I specialize in modern and contemporary South Asia. And of course, at the core of my discipline is also this sort of interest in the aesthetics and culture, um, particularly though focusing on works of art and architecture or visual culture as a means of deepening our engagement uh, with human creativity as it relates to history. Um, I am gonna share, um, I'll share a few brief images now that um, I can refer back to, um, uh, to kind of respond to this question. Um, let me share the screen really quickly. All right, so um, my work to date though has uh, centered around visual culture. Um, for me, the diversity of objects and methods in a visual, visual culture analysis um, have enabled me to de delve into subjects that um, have not received an in-depth examination within my field. So um, I'm studying visual material that is traditionally or in traditional views of art and architectural history have kind of sat outside of what is acceptable um, areas of inquiry. Um, and particularly that focuses on um, the visual world as it intersects with criminal sciences. So um, as you mentioned, um, I have studied uh, fingerprinting in particular. That's um, where I sort of began um, my work um, as a scholar studying fingerprinting sort of not from the perspective of how we know it as an object of criminal science, but rather um, as an image system and trying to understand how fingerprinting in colonial India, this um, technology kind of emanated out from India to the rest of the world um, in the 19th century as a tool uh, for policing, as a tool for, for prison systems and as a tool for colonial, um, colonial systems at large. And so that work on fingerprinting uh, led me to my my current project, which is um, on the history of colonial punishment in India, but trying to take this approach that focuses on visual material. So um, I'm looking at and thinking about works um, or objects that I found in the archive that speak to a spatial and visual culture history. And that has roots in my graduate work. Um, but to date, this, there's this field of critical prison studies and you know, it, it encompasses um, history, geography, political science, gender science or gender studies. But um, sort of the, the visual is kind of sort of there on the periphery um, of much of this uh, work. And so I'm looking at objects like, and I'll, I'll refer to this image later, perhaps in the conversation, but images that I found in the archives that are somehow foregrounded in uh, the visual. So this is an image of an escape map that I found in the archive of prisoners who broke out of a colonial prison. Um, some other images that I've looked at um, include, um, you know, early colonial photography, um, lithography that um, engages with the colonial prison and represents it in different ways. And so I'm trying to think about images and cultural objects and thinking about prisons sort of as these cultural spaces. So how were prisons shaped through the visual representations of the age? Um, and how might we also think about the lived experiences of prisoners um, as they exist um, within these objects? But you know, in thinking about my work and sort of preparing for this conversation, um, it was actually quite interesting for me to kind of reflect back on you know, what brought me to this project in the first place and thinking about how I understood my own um, my own boundaries as a scholar. And so um, when I started this project as a graduate student, um, there was such wonderful work that I felt already existed, right? Where people were thinking about the Indian Ocean, um, thinking about perhaps the penal colony on the Andaman Islands, for example, um, and thinking about the history of convict transportation or what the Black Waters had meant um, in a 19th century imaginary. And so I, I, I sort of started this project um, and, and geographically limited myself. I said, okay, well, well, everyone else has done this wonderful work, I should just stick to mainland India, focusing on prisons um, on the Indian subcontinent um, as a kind of geographical limitation. But of course, as I've developed this project in postgraduate years, um, what's been really um, useful for me or what has been surprising is the way that sort of the Indian Ocean just ends up sort of seeping back in and that, you know, it's it's a, it, it's, it's a totally futile endeavor to try to limit yourself um, in thinking about this work. So, you know, these are, these are just two examples of the many where, you know, there are um, intersections of Indian Ocean, of the Indian Ocean, just in the ways that the images have been configured, what they refer to, um, how they're thinking about the prison. So the image on your left that you're seeing um, is 
is uh, an early 19th century drawing um, drawn in Calcutta, but drawn of a prisoner who's about to be sent across the ocean um, and transported for life. So there's um, embedded in this image, um, this notion of the body in motion and the body that's going to be transported. Um, the other image, which you know is about a century later, um, is a political poster that's touching on um, prison executions that had happened on the mainland, um, but it's also similarly referring to the punishment of transportation and the penal colony on the Andaman Islands. So there's there's kind of embedded in these image, um, you know, the notion of colonial punishment across time and space. And so it's been something that I've been thinking about too in this moment and Indian Ocean Studies as I, I continue to learn more about it, where um, I'm developing my own work work in in conversation to the 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 really sort of provocative frameworks that are emerging from this this area of inquiry so I think you know in in, in the interest of, of, of kind of keeping things brief I'll stop there and then um, continue this conversation in future questions thanks thank you both for starting us off um, and I'll also echo my thanks to my colleagues um, Haywan Gurma and Omar Jelly, with whom it's been such a pleasure um, to do this work since I arrived um, at UNCG um, so right now, all my work feels like Indian Ocean Studies work, this semester especially. In addition to working on the book, about which I'll say more in just a minute, I've been helping build a programmatic or institutional focus on Indian Ocean worlds at UNCG, where I started in fall 2019. The pandemic notwithstanding, uh, my colleagues and I have been able to do a lot with very little time, energy, and also small amounts of money. Um, this series is funded by a small internal grant, um, and that's part of the work that we've been doing in building Indian Ocean Studies here. We're also looking at courses that we've been offering already, as well as developing new ones, such as the two courses that I'm teaching this semester, um, an undergraduate seminar called Literature of the Oceans and a graduate seminar called Oceanic Humanities in the Global South. Um, we're hoping that UNCG students will find these currents of Indian Ocean Studies all over campus. And I see this work of teaching and program building as integral to my scholarship. While the book I'm writing might only bear my name as the author, I know that the work of writing that book is enriched by being in dialogue with my students and colleagues both at and beyond my campus. A little bit about the book then, which started its life as a dissertation. And in that first life, I was really hung up on geography, the where of the Indian Ocean world, and also the what, but mostly the where. Did texts set in port cities count as Indian Ocean texts? What about a text that focused on the caravan trade for, from the port city to the interior, such as Abdul Raza Gurna's 1994 novel, Paradise? Did Amitav Ghosh's Ibis trilogy count? Of course, that one counts. There's a boat, there are Laskars, there's inter-imperial conflict. The Indian Ocean is all over that book. There's opium. Indian Ocean Literary Studies may not yet have a canon, at least not like 19th century US literature does. But if we did, Ghosh would probably be able to make a very strong claim to it. So much of that early work was developing a personal canon, a canon for the project. How would I constitute that? And how did geography pay, play a role in that constitution? More recently though, I've been thinking about the when of Indian Ocean worlds. The work I did in my dissertation showed me that there is not a singular Indian Ocean world, though some places, ideas, and methods are overrepresented in Indian Ocean studies. Indeed, as a scholar of contemporary literature, Indian Ocean worlds are in the past tense, supposedly. But I refuse this claim on a number of points, which I'll withhold for now. We can get into them later. Instead, my work is currently invested in tracing enduring forms of unfree labor through the particularities of Indian Ocean context and how, that, how those forms persist in the contemporary, even if slavery has been legally abolished. As I revise the manuscript, I'm especially interested in foregrounding how anti-Blackness is operating in the cultural imaginaries of the peoples of the Indian Ocean world, and how thinking at the intersection of unfree labor and how it's racialized can make a meaningful contribution to the larger scholarship on racial capitalism. Right now, I'm at that stage of the book, having written some new material as the dissertation steeps in itself, coupled with research trips that are now indefinitely postponed due to the pandemic, that everything is out of the suitcases that I had put the things in. They're all strewn about. And as I think through how to put together um, the book version, 
uh, there's been an incredible flourishing of novels in particular that I'm eager to think with as the project moves forward. And I'll just name four of them um, in case folks in the audience are interested. Victoria Princewell's In the Palace of Flowers, which is coming out in the US in May, published by Cassava Republic, is a historical fiction thinking about um, slavery in the Persian context. Yvonne Adiawo Awards The Dragonfly Sea, published by Penguin Random House and Jahazi Press, is looking at sort of China-Africa relationship from the perspective of the Swahili coast and the Lamu archipelago. Bettina Gapa's Out of Darkness, Shining Light with Simon and Schuster tells the story of um, the caravan of folks who carry David Livingstone's body um, back to the coast um, and on to Europe. And Joka Alarthi's Celestial Bodies, which is translated from the Arabic by Marilyn Booth. And so those are four books that I'm incredibly excited to think with as I move this project into its book iteration. Thank you all for those um, answers to our first set of questions. I think you got us started to a very interesting discussion. So my next set of questions, um, and we'll go in the same order as we did before, is um, how did you come to be involved in this field? And how do you say, see it shaping the work that you're doing? So we're kind of asking sort of um, intellectual biography of sorts. So May, let's start with you. Okay, thank you. Um, um, so I'd like to share my screen. Let me know if you can see it. Um, yes, we can see it. Okay, great. So um, it's a beautiful question. Um, and uh, it's one that uh, it's taken me 30 years to actually fully realize my dream, which I realize now is a dream of embodied phenomenology. It's, it's, an, it's an applied praxis of being from the Indian Ocean. So I live in Manhattan. This is a view of Manhattan from the sea, from, 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 from the Hudson River area, from the harbor. But I, this is a, a shot during my class. So I teach a walking history of New York. We go to a different island of New York every week. There are, the archipelago is a 40 islands. So we visit about 15 islands during the course of the semester. And to me, this is an applied methodology of an Indian Ocean praxis. What do I mean by that? Much of the region of the Indian Ocean is, um, is people by low-lying regions and living, uh, coming from Tanzania and uh, having also uh, grown up in the Malabar, I've become very conscious of low-lying regions. And with this, with this view, I've applied my teaching. This is a view from Brooklyn to Manhattan. And um, for me, this bringing students to the coast and thinking about low-lying regions and the shared methodologies of what it means to be in a in a in in in, in a phenomenology of the Anthropocene. This has been my um, sort of thinking in my teaching. And uh, very quickly, I, I just want to lay out the methodology through which um, I have been coming to um, an understanding of what I do as Indian Ocean Praxis. This is a project by uh, Eric Sanderson, uh, where he uh, he's a biologist, but he morphed uh, through sort of um, through the computer uh, to com computer uh, science uh, what it would have looked like in Manhattan before the coming of the uh, Europeans. Uh, and the, the the image below is uh, you know uh, it's contemporary after 9/11. Um, and so there are these series of images that I have used, the before and the after of the Anthropocene to ask my students the question, how do we think about uh, an, an indigenous uh, knowledge practice, uh, 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 you know, practice that might think about a Lenape ecology. Uh, and for me, this has been very critical in how I have come to what I think of as an embodied Indian Ocean phenomenology. It's a transoceanic one. And it is shaped by this image of Gandhi in Union Square in New York. Um, and it's also shaped by the realization that New Amsterdam, which is New York, was one of the last anthropods of the Dutch East India Company, of which the VOC, this is the atlas uh, of the Dutch East India Company, it has 600 anthropods, 600 maps in here. And so for me, the work, as you say, how did I come to this work is because I'm from Tanzania and grew up in this Afro-Arab Asian um, kind of uh, syncretic environment. Uh, this is an image I took at the tip of Great Cape of Good Hope in South Africa at Cape Town. It has images of two, two journeys that have really shaped my work. One is that of Bartolomeu Diaz, the blue one, and the red one is uh, Dagama's journey that changed the history of the Indian Ocean um, with, that, uh, with, that, with that turning of the Cape of Good Hope. 
And so my first book, Fluid New York, argued that, in, that New York City is an Indian Ocean city. And the way I did that was to show through the mapping of New Amsterdam in relation to the entrepreneurs in, uh, in Asia and Africa, that New York has much more in common with India and Cape Town and Cochin and, 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 and Batavia than it ever did with Europe. It was never in conversation with Europe because the governor generals and the colonial administrators that came from Batavia to Cochin to Kapstadt and then finally to New Amsterdam were bringing these knowledges of how to tame um, the quote unquote new world savages. So, um, so in terms of how I have come to my work, I think today I'm very shaped by this tsunami of 2004 that led me to create then uh, a question of how can I bring my theater training to think about today's um, climate issues. And uh, so the work I have done is layered the Dutch East India Company map with the uh, tsunami map, with the months in Asia map, and the map now of the sinking cities of Asia. These are the, the lowest, these are the most the densest cities of Asia, but they are also the cities that are low lying because they were former colonial entrepreneurs. So in terms of your question to me, how did I come to my work? Well, it's these different maps of colonial and, and ecological and, uh, uh, and uh, today's uh, environmental issues that have really shaped both my pedagogy in New York as an applied Indian Ocean pedagogy, but also to ask myself, how can I as an individual do uh, create, activate both the consciousness of the Indian Ocean in the, in the Americas uh, and also how to teach my students to think about low-lying regions of the world. I just want to point out, this was one of the first projects I did. It's a performance in Governor's Island uh, which wasn't the first island the Dutch arrived in New York Harbor. And so we created this performance to mark the fact that the Dutch bought this island from the, from the Lenape peoples for two axe heads and a handful of white beads. So that was the price they paid. So this was a performance that was uh, centered around the connectivities between the Indian Ocean and um, and uh, New York City, but also to uh, reactivate a memory of that theft. I'll stop there for now. Oh, I should stop this the screen share. I think. Sorry about that. Is that good? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, so, you know, for me, um, I stumbled on on my field by, by honestly sheer accident is the way I, I like to think about it. Um, you know, I, um, as a person of Indian origin, I was as many undergraduate students sort of trying to find some means of self-discovery through my undergraduate courses and was planning a trip to India. And it had been the only time I had, I hadn't been there since I was a child. And so I, I found this sort of history of art and architecture class on South Asia. And for me, that was this sort of, in this is kind of desire to journey to India, um, found this discipline that I've, you know, dedicated my life to. And so um, in, in studying the visual, um, I um, have found that for me, it's, it's just a, a, a very clean way for me to understand the world, to have an anchor. Um, you know, but I also had this interdisciplinary training sort of th through my undergraduate degree. I was an English literature major, would have loved to take um, Dr. Kadir's courses because that's exactly what I would have wanted as an undergraduate. Um, but, uh, you know, came to the history of art and architecture um, as a graduate student sort of thinking um, through interdisciplinarity, um, which is something I think that um, Indian Ocean Studies does so well and we'll, we can continue to talk about it. Um, but it, I, I think that kind of interdisciplinary approach allowed me to move to material that does sit sort of uncomfortably um, within sort of the more traditional history of my discipline. Now my discipline is moving in sort of exciting and new compelling directions, but for me that fluidity was something that um, I I was um, able to kind of look at stuff that that sat outside that lens. Um, and, you know, I wanted to work on something that was a contemporary subject, but when I started doing my graduate work, really found myself lost in 19th century, 18th century archives, and um, have found um, this real connection to the past when I'm sifting through the physical materiality of those objects in the archives, um, working through those histories of lived experience that record the everyday lives of people. And um, in turning to those historical records, um, I sort of draw on this kind of post-colonial subaltern studies training that um, 
uh, tries to read through the archive or of course unlearn its authority. Um, so, um, and if, and I, I'll, I'll leave it, I'll leave it down, but there was an, an image of the map of an escape, which has kind of been really sort of central to um, my approach as somebody working on visual material, because I'm interested in, in spaces and how spaces are represented and how spaces are imagined. And so I'm looking at these instances in the archive when we can find in the everyday um, this moment of rupture or this moment where um, the narrative of a prison as a space of punishment has been ruptured or challenged by the, the kind of spatial experiences that exist there. Um, and so this kind of background in, in reading through archives and looking at archives has been um, really um, productive when I, when I do this work and, and finding these spatial occasions and finding these spatial uh, occurrences. And so looking at these, um, evidences as a kind of space making, um, but then also thinking about sort of Indian Ocean worlds as spaces, right, um, is something that has been sort of really useful for me as I'm sort of familiarizing myself with the discipline more and more or the area of study. So um, I, uh, I think I can probably leave it at there for now, but we'll pick up more threads and um, yeah, I'll just stop there for now. <laughs> I have so many questions for you, but I'm going to withhold them for now. Um, so for me, the Indian Ocean has been a part of my life as long as I have known life. I was born on one of its port cities, Karachi, and for most of my life, my maternal uncle worked for a Scottish shipping company. My Bardinana or elder grandfather um, in Urdu worked as a Nakoda or ship's captain, and then later at the Karachi Port Trust. Both my uncle and grandfather know the routes of my research. Yet our professional lives couldn't be more different. Um, in 1995, when I was still quite young, my family moved to another major port city, Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic. We all learned a third language, my parents doing so in their 30s, Spanish. My mother re often remarked that Santo Domingo was just like Karachi. Um, and that plays in my mind all the time. But when I was applying to graduate programs, I pitched a comparative project on British and French empires. I wanted to focus on the cultural production of their post colonies. I applied strangely to exactly zero comparative literature departments um, due to some limited mentorship, let's be honest, um, and somehow elected not to focus on the languages that I was already fluent in, in addition to English, Urdu and Spanish. And I mentioned that for two reasons. Strong mentorship is vital and that we need to be conscientious about how we reproduce colonial epistemes. In July, 2012, while giving a talk on the 19th century black writer, Martin Delaney's serial, Blake or the Huts of America at the Festival del Caribe in Santiago de Cuba, I snapped out of the fog that I had been in for most of my coursework. In that moment, as I heard my paper, which I was delivering in English being live translated into Spanish and French right before me, I knew that my work had to refuse monolingual terms. How would I get to that multilingual life again? Visiting Mantanzas earlier in that trip, one of the cities from which Blake plots his hemispheric insurrection also taught me that my work need not concede itself to a colonial cartography. I had to unsettle that terrain somehow. So you see, it was the Black Atlantic that encouraged me to turn or turn back toward the Indian Ocean. That fall, a new faculty member joined UMass Amherst where I did my graduate work and he was joint appointed to history and econ. Professor Johan Matthew was the first person I met who did Indian Ocean studies. Alongside my English department mentors, Ashanad Karni, a scholar of feminist studies in South Asia and its diasporas, and Rachel Mordecai, a scholar of the Caribbean, I had the intellectual breadth and generous mentorship that I needed to take on a dissertation project that I'm currently revising as a monograph. Let me close this moment then by naming a few texts that shape the intellectual project. Um, Gaurav Desai's Commerce of the Universe, Africa, India, and the Afrasian Imagination um, was published by Columbia University Press in 2013, just as I was finishing coursework. Isabel Hoffmeyer is somebody that I'd be remiss not to mention, and several of her essays, particularly The Black Atlantic Meets the Indian Ocean, published in 2007, have been absolutely foundational for me. Two books by Duke University Press that are always teaching me how to do my work are Lisa Lowe's The Intimacies of Four Continents, 2015, and Christina Sharp's In the Wake on Blackness and Being. Mm. 
Um, thank you all. You've given us so much to think about. I, I love the comparisons between um, the Indian Ocean world and the Black Atlantic or New York City or some of the other cities that we know of in this area. So I'm sure there's going to be quite a few questions on that in the Q&A. But um, let's move on to the next question that we already have prepared. So um, my next question is, each of you have done work work that engages with uh, questions of aesthetics and cultural studies. So what has been particularly salient for doing that work through an oceanic framework, particularly that of the Indian Ocean? Okay. Great, thank you. Um, may I share my screen again? Thanks. Um, Great. Uh, sorry, can you see my screen? Yes. Terrific. Okay. So um, I'm so engrossed in both uh, Mira and, and Nilofa's work, and I'm trying to find my way back to my thoughts. Uh, so as I was saying that um, as a teacher, um, I, I, you know, I wanted to respond to the impending um, crisis of, of climate. And I began to engage with historic um, uh, archives of the Dutch and Portuguese period to try to trace the, the, the ecological past of, um, of the Malabar coast. So um, my work has involved um, sort of using Dutch and Portuguese archives as a, as a way to, de, um, to, to sort of de, uh, colonize the memories of the past because of the way in which these these constructions are still extant in the landscape today. So this is a uh, part of the landscape of, of Malabar and this landscape, the, uh, which was the maps I showed you in the last two shots, um, is, the, is the current landscape which is completely um, uh, vulnerable to the storms. But it is a landscape in the, in the archives of, of, of the Dutch and Portuguese navigators. You know, they talk about uh, this excellent place for uh, for the Dutch and the Portuguese to settle, so I uh, my work has been sort of retracing this uh, these these landscapes, Varkala in this in this case, and this is the old Roman port uh, harbor in in Kerala called Kayankulam. So um, the work I've been doing is to uh, create performances along this landscape. Um, this particular site, for instance, is um, the site through which uh, Marco Polo would have come, but it's where my, I grew up in this fort. It's called Fort Tangasheri, and it's where my mother lives right now. So, uh, so the challenges for me has been to sort of say, how do we move, uh, uh, you know, into a decolonial framework of sort of unpacking the purges of the past, because for some of us, it's not so easy to just move on. We're talking about architectures, the architectures of fear and the architectures of uh, colonization still contaminate the Anthropocene. So um, I am actually having very strange um, tech problems. So uh, I, be, I created a, a series of performances, but it, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm actually not, my cursor is actually not working. I'm going to uh, try one more time, then I will just stop this and just talk about it. I have a bunch of images. Uh, uh, so I will just go through these images. This is the performance I did in Cochin. Uh, but the idea is that I, I created performance along Cochin, Cape Town and Lisbon. Um, as ways of engaging with the map I showed you earlier of the Portuguese travels to Asia. And you never see women engaging with these sites. And so for me, the approach of an embodied phenomenology was to return the gaze and to return the questions of an embodied inquiry, an inquiry of inserting the decolonial subject in these sites. This is the site of Dagama's fort, uh, built by uh, for, for King Manuel in Fort Cochin, where my family live. Um, so creating these uh, possession uh, rituals, these rituals of trans and anti-colonial performances along these sites has been one way for me to, uh, to re-engage with um, certain uh, questions that the, uh, the historical and anthropological studies of the Indian Ocean um, may not sort of unpack entirely uh, because much of the studies in the historical um, uh, research is uh, frequently that of non-humans. Um, 
and you know it's 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 the tra it's the tracing of commodities and objects and 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 I guess um, and now increasingly with the new work with sentiments and aesthetics and emotions. Uh, but for me, um, I think the question of shame and 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 guilt and um, fear and uh, the longing desires of women who were brought as slaves um, to from Batavia to to Cochin uh, to Quailon in the case of my great 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 grandmother. You know, how do we begin to ask these questions? So I'm having enormous technical difficulty, but I will just press um, see if I can share one or two more images and just call it. Okay, I, I think I, I'll stop right there. So I'm I'm just going to get off this and just say. Um, this is unfortunate because I have such wonderful images uh, to share with you. Um, so I, I just want to sort of, uh, sort of just open it up to say that the challenge of a speculative history, a history of returning subjectivity to the Indian Ocean, and, and especially women and, and minorities who are who are not the sites of colonial inquiry and not the sites of a lot of the uh, contemporary networks that are being mapped, we sort of fall out. And this was part of the project of my performances across the Indian Ocean. And I've been engaging with many sites from uh, Cochin and Cape Town and, and Lisbon and Amsterdam. Um, to Venice. I mean, these are all the big navigational routes. These are all the people who came to the town. My mother's from Quailan. And I wanted to return these journeys by asking other kinds of questions to excavate an aesthetic of the past, but through the unspoken and unforgotten and buried archives, the archives that are under the sea in the way that Christina Sharp also has laid so beautifully for us. So, um, so yeah, I think this question of uh, what everyone's asking is, is really uh, provocative and how one engages with it. I think the materiality of the ocean, the, um, the, 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 the irretrievable memories of the past, particularly that of women and 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 children and and the forgotten subjects of history. I think this has been some of my engagements with trying to think of an Indian Ocean methodology, which is an embedded method methodology, an immersive methodology in the in the in the swamps and the wetlands and the water and the and the under the water uh, questions that the Indian Ocean provokes. For me, the Indian Ocean is not just academic and it's not just the archive it's a, it's it's a, it's an aesthetic it's a lifestyle it's a it's a pedagogy it's a methodology it's all of these things so bringing all of that to bear in my daily uh practice as a teacher i think that's my goal yeah your art your your images are so wonderful i hope that we can see the rest of them <laughs> um uh well <laughs> so in thinking oh, about no, no, they're so wonderful. Um, uh, well, in terms of thinking about my own um, relationship to an oceanic framework, in a sense, it sort of I need it to decolonize myself in a sense, and the way that I go about thinking about punishment and I think about um, relationships. So, of course, you know, I start with prisons in, in South Asia, and then I'm drawn to thinking about prisons in the, the quote unquote metropole. But of course, that kind of limitation um, is something that I've been working and striving to get out of and to expand this kind of comparison or comparative approach to thinking about prisons beyond just this kind of colony metropole relationship. So that's one sort of um, one sort of thing that I've been really working at it, as I've been refining this dissertation now postgraduate project um, and in altering its approach. Um, uh, another thing that um, has been really useful to me in the more I read of Indian Ocean um, studies and Indian Ocean frameworks is that sort of ability, not only, of course, as I've mentioned, to be interdisciplinary, but that focused on the everyday and the value that can be found in the study of sort of everyday lives. And um, so for me, um, um, as I work on thinking about anti-colonial strategies um, and anti-colonial resistance in prison spaces or carceral spaces, Spaces. Um, one of the things that I focus on is thinking about the hunger strike, but not just the hunger strike as it sort of appears in prisons in South Asia, but the way that it actually has connections to Asian African life worlds. And so we might think about um, how we can understand resistance um, as a kind of regional phenomenon and understanding those stories and those sort of everyday practices more thoroughly. Um, I think, though, um, 
for me also though, um, what is really important about Indian Ocean frameworks, um, especially um, not just beyond my research, but in the work that I do is really understanding how I can embed that framework in my teaching kind of as May is, is raising in her own in her own work, but that because it's so important, especially um, as someone whose discipline is very much, um, was very much forged in this kind of 19th century imperialist logic where, you know, courses were designed to tell an imperialist story. So how do I actually decolonize or how do I contribute to decolonization efforts um, within my very discipline? And so I think, you know, I, I have the privilege at, at my institution to teach um, Asian art and architectural history, Islamic art and architectural history. And when I encounter students at that undergraduate level, it's 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 sort of trying to teach them that there's this thing called the global that they think of as this kind of modern contemporary phenomenon, but that if we actually study these ideas and imaginaries across different life worlds, that they have a more robust understanding of what that actually means. And that, you know, an Indian Ocean framework, particularly as it's being developed within my field, is actually providing a way to, to to deconstruct that Western narrative of, let's say, the art history survey that begins in ancient Greece and takes us to the history of modern art, um, but we find these other connections in the rest of the world. And so it's a really critical framework, I think, for this kind of these broader conversations that are happening um, around um, how do we, you know, move these disciplines with these imperialist origins uh, into the future and into the present. And so I think that's what's, for me, sort of really, really important about this framework and, and what I'm, I've been striving to impart Part, um, to my students um, so that they can they can they can kind of decolonize even their very notion of what it means to be global so I'll stop there that's such a great segue into what I'm thinking about so thank you for that um, an oceanic framework has been critical for me in redirecting my attention away from the postcolonial diasporas in the global north so in the US and Canada in France and England not because that work isn't important or those sites aren't generative for thinking, uh, but it's my sense that especially in literary, literary studies, thinking about those diasporas has become a bit hegemonic and how we understand migration and mobility, um, particularly in the second half of the 20th century. So they get cast as these um, strikingly new phenomena when in fact, um, they probably aren't. Um, of course, the 21st century has returned us to waterways emphatically um, whether it's in the stories of refugees and asylum seekers that are crossing the Mediterranean or the Andaman Seas in boats that are unfit for passengers, folks that are attempting to swim across rivers like the Rio Grande, um, intensified storms and floods that are displacing people across the world, but particularly in the global south, as Professor Joseph's work has shown us. Um, so for me, the Indian Ocean framework has calibrated my attention towards circular or multi-directional mobilities rather than unidirectional immigration. This focus allows me to consider together folks for whom such mobility is desirable and easy, as well as those who are in forced cycles of mobility, the multiply displaced who repeatedly find themselves encountering the logics and infrastructures of the security state. Understanding these figures as imbricated in one another's experience of mobility from a context that has a very long history of such braiding is really vital to de-exceptionalizing contemporary claims of flexible mobility and specialized economic zones and labor. I can't help but think, um, Professor Joseph, when you mention how women and um, minorities of many kinds sort of written out of earlier historical periods of the Indian Ocean that so much of the labor um, diaspora or labor migration that is currently happening across the zone we might call the Indian Ocean is not only of female laborers but in feminized situations of care work of the domestic um, work arena, but also in feminized forms as precarious labor, right? And I think that noticing the sort of um, reiteration of certain patterns of migration in terms of the routes, but then thinking what today's routes might get us to ask about the past's routes and relationships has been really critical for me. Thank you again, all, um, for your um, answers. And I want to encourage the audience to start posting questions in the q and I have one less set of um, moderated questions, but I want to uh, make sure that people do get to um, ask the questions that they have. So the last set of questions that I have for all of you is, um, 
And some of you might have already alluded to this, um, but I'm gonna ask you to expand on it a little bit more. Um, what do you see as some of the most exciting work that is being done in your fields? And what advice do you have for early career scholars um, and undergraduate study students who might be interested in pursuing similar questions and issues? That's uh, that, that's very exciting. You know, this I have to say, I I am um, I actually called a friend of mine in some kind of panic this week, saying, "What, what do you make? How, what sense are you making from all these these uh, Indian Ocean talks and seminars that are happening all over the U.S.? I mean, I, I can't keep up with them. There's there's there's, there's Lindsay Bremner in England and 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 this stuff in Australia, and and I want to listen to all of them, and I feel like I'm missing out. And you know, I've been working alone from for 30 years of you know finding my way into this, and today there are so many scholars, and so. I, I have to say, when you say what's the new and exciting work out there, for me, I will say that I've been really excited by the volume by uh, Smriti Srinivas, Reimagining Indian Ocean Worlds, that has a number of performers and visual artists who talk, and, and you know, you did have Neelima, um, uh, you know, Jaya Chandran, who, whose work I find extremely important, and Srinivas's work on somatic uh, Indian Ocean, you know, her work on Sai Baba and, and her, you know, so there's this new kind of work that's probing not necessarily the literary, but the somatic, ontological, uh, phenomenological, you know, the, 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 the most speculative and the more, uh, uh, shall we say, the more um, amorphous uh, spheres of the, of the Indian Ocean that are harder to, uh, to unpack, but that are also like sort of Afro-Indian, um, uh, Arab, Chinese, uh, you know, uh, continental. I mean, it, it's it's all blurry and it's all messy. And how do we unpack those emotive and somatic regimes? I think it's a challenge uh, without simplifying it. So uh, for me, some of the some of the really exciting work is coming out of these junctures, of which your series of talks, I think, for me was very helpful, and a number of other talks uh, that coming out in different junctures. But I think this connection of legal and somatic and aesthetic. And so because much of the work has been anthropological and historical and political economy. And, and you know, that's the sort of the, the field as it went. So all of these new tangents to me is a very exciting uh, possibility and promise of what's going on. And I welcome all you younger scholars that are provoking these kinds of exchanges. So for me, that's where the exciting work is. It's, it's also very collaborative and extremely uh, irreverent. Uh, it's merging multiple fields. Uh, a lot of the work that's coming up truly interdisciplinary. I will say that um, in, for, for younger scholars, that unfortunately the US, for all its claims to interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity, in terms of tenure, people are incredibly conservative and incre incredibly disciplinarily bound. So I think for your first book, you have to be very conservative. Unlike me, I wrote what they call a post tenure book for tenure because I wrote an Indian Ocean book and it upset, you know, it just didn't fit any, any guidelines for people who were, who were, you know, going by fields and area studies. And at the time, you know, 30 years ago, this was not known, you know, 25 years ago, Indian Ocean was not legitimate in the aesthetic field. So, um, so I will say just, you know, treading those minefields, I think hasn't gone away. There's the seductiveness of interdisciplinary post and transdisciplinarity. And then there is a real in, in sort of uh, closing in of the fields because of money and funding and the way uh, the US Academy is under duress. So I think uh, just playing carefully how you, what you publish where and, and, and when, I think is still um, just sort of the minefield to navigate. Um, I, I similarly have been uh, absolutely, you know, floored and excited by the fact that there's always does seem to be a talk on something related to the Indian Ocean. There's another one tomorrow. I mean, it's it's just been absolutely incredible and in what has been a, a deeply challenging year to be able to be so globally connected to all of these wonderful talks and, you know, find this field on Zoom in a way and uncover the way that people are doing different kinds of work. So um, in, in, that, in that regard, sort of speaking very, very 
very disciplinarily specific as an art and architectural historian, um, some of the most exciting work that I see that sort of connects with Indian Ocean frameworks, um, I think really concerns when this, this kind of uh, movemented understanding of objects. Um, and I'm thinking here specifically about some of the work that's being done on textiles, for example, um, and the way that um, if we you know, look at textiles, not only sort of thinking about their designs, but their provenance and the way that you know, textiles um, have you know, impacted the lives of people, we start to um, just complicate narratives and tell interesting stories. Um, and, and they have sort of multi-pronged factors. So not only you know, does the, an Indian Ocean framework with respect to the study of the textile sort of interrupt this narrative of you know, the West in the 19th century and its decimation of um, indigenous textile industries, because of course it's a completely different story if we look at the relationship between what's happening in India or the Indian subcontinent and then Africa with respect to the textile, but that it also has um, sort of profound implications for how we might go about rectifying the violence of um, the history of textiles. So people looking at archives to recuperate or resuscitate lost weaving practices and the production of different kinds of objects. Um, so all of that is just really, really exciting um, and um, provocative. Um, I'm also really, um, you know, I don't do this work myself and I want to find more ways to do it. But like, like with respect to um, the sort of Anthropocene connections that Professor Joseph is exploring, um, but the fact that that Indian Ocean Frameworks is allowing for a much more environmentally rich approach, which I think is absolutely necessary for sort of the future of various disciplines that engage with aesthetics and cultural studies. So this ability to think environmentally um, about the work that we do. And so um, I'm really excited about all of those, those, those projects projects, um, the talks that are going to continue on this semester. <laughs> so all of it's quite wonderful. Um, I, I suppose in thinking about, you know, um, I, I, I had similarly thought about, so how do you, how do you weave this, this line of being a scholar who is trained in a discipline and then wants to do interdisciplinary work? Um, and uh, you know, I, 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 I think that Professor Joseph has said it best, you know, <laughs> so, um, but I think maybe I'll just gear my comments more towards that sort of undergraduate level, because I, I find with, our, with my students often, um, you know, this kind of narrowing um, that's happening at the undergraduate level, and that's really where um, I think there can be so much more freedom in terms of how, you know, students take classes and, and looking for these more unexpected pairings, because um, from my own sort of backstory of how I, I arrived at where I am today, um, it was it was only by you know by sheer sort of desire to to look for something outside of what it was I was studying that I kind of found a way into thinking about um, the world and trying to understand it through through academic research, but also beyond. And so um, you know for students just trying to find that space, which is hard because they have these majors and they have to to do everything and there's limited time, but trying to find that space where they have the freedom to, to think in that way is so, you know, surprising mentors can come from different areas, but yeah, thanks. I'll just, I'll stop there. Thanks so much. Um, I'm going to name a few folks um, and I'm going to start with um, colleagues who are dissertating or working on exams and proposals because it's Graduate Student Appreciation Week in the U.S. Um, so for starters, Mapule Mahulatsi, who's based at the University of Witzwaters, of the Witzwaters and the and the wiser um, is writing a dissertation on racial interspecies histories, recipes, and the Black radical traditions relationship with the deep ocean. She's also the author of a children's book. Um, Tamara Fernando is at the University of Cambridge, where she researches the marine environmental history of the Indian Ocean. And part of the focus of her project is on 19th century pearl fisheries. Um, and a really wonderful article by her called Ecology's Ghost um, appeared in um, The Hypocrite Reader this week. Um, you can find talks by both Mapule and Tamara on YouTube um, at the Georgetown uh, Cutters um, Oceanic Circularities Conference that happened in February of 2020. Um, another graduate student is Shrutama Chatterjee, who's at the University of Pittsburgh, um, is working at the intersections of oceanic studies, post-colonial studies, and cultural studies. And she's currently engaged in humanities fieldwork in the Shunderbunds um, and working on her comprehensive exam. So I'm really excited um, for the project that she's going to develop through that. 
Um, in addition to these three scholars and their work, there have been a number of amazing books, like almost too many to read in the time that exists, um, but I'll mention just two. Um, one is Debashri Mukherjee's Bombay Hustle, Making Moves in a Colonial City out with Columbia University Press in 2020, um, and one that's in progress by Samhita Sunya, which is called Sirens of Modernity, World Cinema via Bombay, which is under contract with the University of California Press. And I bring up these two books because um, they're making a really important contribution, I think, to the enduring connectivity of Indian Ocean networks during the middle part of the 20th century, um, a period that often has been considered by historians as a moment where Indian Ocean connectivities sort of dissipate in the formation of the post-colonial nation state. Um, I also want to mention Hiba Ali, who is finishing their PhD and is working on a project on the Black Indian Ocean, also a multimedia artist. So the one thing that I'm fascinated by um, in terms of the folks that I'm mentioning um, is that many of them are working in creative and critical fields simultaneously or have a history of doing that work. And I think that really enriches um, the scholarship, but so the other works that they produce. Um, as folks have already mentioned, so many conferences, seminars, and podcasts, including Deputy Morales' uh, Material Histories of the Indian Ocean Worlds, which has an event tomorrow, so I recommend folks to check that out. And then finally, let me plug the New Books Network Indian Ocean World Channel podcast, um, particularly the work that Ahmed Almazmi um, has done, which has been critical to just building that channel, and then Kelvin Eng, who has also done some really phenomenal interviews. Um, Emmett's dissertation focuses on environmental and legal studies and Kelvin's work, as I understand it, focuses on intellectual and labor histories of the early 20th century. Um, so let me pivot really quickly to advice, which is to listen to that podcast because it's a great way to stay current in the field um, in a really broad and open-ended way, even if your own work is not that interdisciplinary. I still think it's really great to know. For someone who never had a chance to take a course in Indian Ocean Studies, the interviews that these folks have done um, have been a godsend now, but especially would have been when I was doing comps um, and basically mainlining Indian Ocean history. Um, I also really recommend in building these outlets with one another because they're collaborative and interdisciplinary. Again, even if your own work isn't, you'll feel less alone in doing this work than I did during my graduate program. Um, I wanna encourage folks to resist silos and insularity and think with and exchange work with people who are working on similar questions as you, even if they don't work on the same geography, time period or methodology as you. Um, thinking with people who are asking similar questions in different contexts can be really enriching. And then toward that, don't rely on a single advisor or mentor, build networks that are multi-scalar. Peers are just as important as senior people in your field. Um, check in with all of these people regularly, whatever that looks like for you, uh, because these are the relationships that will help you stay afloat. I will end there. Thank you all for those amazing advice and uh, kind of mapping out like the future of Indian Ocean Studies and there's a lot of exciting things happening at the moment. So uh, before I proceed, I would like to uh, acknowledge Dr. Omar Ali who joined us a little bit late. Uh, Dr. Ali is part of the uh, organizers of this uh, Ashby Dialogue series. He is a professor of African American African Diaspora Studies and History as well as the Dean of the Lloyd International Honors College at uh, the University of North Carolina, Greensboro. He has authored and edited a number of works, including Malik Ambar, Power and Slavery Across the Indian Ocean World, and with Jasmine Graves, um, uh, Behrose Shroff, and Kenneth Robin, the three volume collection Afro South Asia in the Global African Diaspora. So, welcome. Thank Omar. you. <laughs> And we have a couple of questions uh, that is already coming into the Q&A and I'll um, address this, um, I'll read uh, these questions, uh, but I would also like to encourage other participants to please post any questions that you may have uh, for the panelists. We still have a good 30 minutes for uh, Q&A, uh, which is exciting. Um, so first question, um, and this is a question from Rahel Ama, uh, who asks, the Indian Ocean um, is increasing a major is increasingly a major topic in the regional contemporary art world, both in terms of artist projects, even events like the Kochi, Lahore, Sharaj Biennial, and institutions like the Africa Institute. 
So how does Indian Ocean Studies as an academic discipline intersect with that? Whoever would like to start. Maybe I'll take a stab. Um, only because I tried to get into the Cochin Biennale and no one responded to me when I wrote to them saying, look, I'm fabulous. I've actually performed on the Kochi port and take a look at my work and, you know. So uh, I, I think, I think uh, these are parallel uh, networks. I do think people like Neelima, um, Jay Chandran are connected. There are academics who are connected, but my sense, and I, I've been at the Culture Biennale last year, um, so it, it's fascinating and it's wonderful. Um, um, it's also interesting how I noticed with the Biennale, a lot of the comments were from literary people who are not necessarily Indian Ocean scholars. Um, it was just very interesting the, the connections that 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 it didn't actually harness a lot of the Indian Ocean scholars that I you know, that I thought could be in, in conversation with the Biennale. So I, while I'm not, I'm, I'm just doing a sweeping comment from the one Biennale I attended, but uh, it's a very good question. I, I imagine there are uh, sort of overlapping, uh, but my sense is also it's parallel. One is sort of corporate and hospitality driven uh, cultural, which is the Biennale itself, because my cousins in Cochin say, ah, oh, it's too posh, you know, I don't go to a lot of those things. So interesting, the class divide that the Biennale sets up. Um, I'm just sort of skirting around the question, but to say, I think they're multi-layer or multi-scalar impact and, uh, and, and, and engagements with the academic community. Uh, perhaps uh, it's probably more journalistic than scholarly is what I got from it. Yeah, I, I certainly think, you know, there's been a, a lot that's focused on the ways in which these Biennales uh, have kind of uh, moved money around, so to speak, across the globe so that, you know, we, you know, you could conjure this kind of traditional image of Venice and the Biennale there, but the ways in which um, in con contemporary art worlds, um, the these massive scale art fairs and art festivals are are shifting across the globe. So I think it's um, my my sense so far in, in in what I've read about these events and and having studied them a, a very small amount is that it has a lot to do with kind of um, shifting objectives in the contemporary art world and where um, you know where money is going and where people are exhibiting um, and could benefit more from an Indian Ocean framework. To be honest, I think right and kind of. Um, thinking about what this means um, um, and and hopefully it will go there so far because they are really interesting events that have, um, you know, in some respects um, sort of decentered um, the power of Western art markets. Um, so um, hopefully that um, somebody will pick up that thread perhaps and, and do some work there. I don't have anything to add. I just have a bunch of questions. Um, I'd be really curious to think about how that's shaping collections, whether private collections or uh, museum and galleries um, collaborating, but like, I don't know enough about the art world to comment beyond that, but thank you for that great question, Rahel. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you all. Um, we have another question from uh, Sriam um, Sip. Sorry if I'm going to mispronounce this name, <laughs> Srihtama uh, Chatterjee. Um, and this is a question for Professor Joseph. Um, says, I am intrigued by the trope of maps that you use throughout your talk today, along with the embodied nature of Indian Ocean world methodologies. I am wondering, how are you positioning both maps and embodied performance in your forthcoming work on archipelagos? I asked this as someone who is currently developing a final summer project on maps and mapping that I want to teach subject to enrollment? That's such a beautiful question. And I, I, I guess I, you know, I've come to the using of maps in my talk because I live in the US and, you know, in a pedagogical effort to, to, to connect students to the mapping of the Indian Ocean. I've, I've, I've drawn on maps and, you know, visceral maps, but I think it's also, as a subject of a formerly colonized space, I am so mapped, 
you know, in, in my sensibilities, you know, I speak, so I grew up speaking Swahili and, you know, my parents speak Malayalam and I speak English and I spoke Gujarati because most of the neighbors were Gujarati and, you know, I speak Tamil because I grew up, you know, so these mappings that are linguistic and, and, and that are, are, are colonial and there are subject, you know, the, the mappings of, of, of the, the, the things that have disappeared in one's life. Um, you know, so that so I think uh, the use of maps to come to the Indian Ocean uh, has been necessary for me because the layers are so complex that uh, I have found that imposing my body on these forts, imposing the bodies of the locals, the fishermen, and the and the people who live in these former for colonized sites as a mapping process has been necessary to disinter forgotten stories. Yeah, I, 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 and then so it's it's a wonderful question. I'm not doing justice to it, but I do think the Indian Ocean, like many other formerly colonized spaces in the world, uh, has many uh, somatic and ontological and philosophical phenomenological layers that are maps that um, you know that that they're, they're like like onion layers, right? So so disinterring that is the excavating of that uh, has led me to um, the super imposing of bodily maps on on, on navigational and uh, seafaring and uh, Portuguese Dutch col colonial maps. Um. I like how you say that you've been over mapped and because <laughs> that's the that's the world that we kind of live in um, this colonial um, environment, uh, this post colonial environment um, and your your answer also made me think about um, the use of language and how uh, there's a dominance of certain languages colonial languages over others. Um, and we've talked about how interdisciplinary uh, the field is. Um, and there's also an over-reliance on colonial archives, but I'm also thinking, how do we use, um, I don't know if I'm articulating this well, but how do we use, uh, I guess, different languages or different entry points, because as artists, as literary critics, um, to, to expand this field a little bit more. Um, right, and I just want to add one more layer to that very good question, because now we're in the era of climate change, I think mapping is so central, which is why I included the maps of the monsoon maps and the tsunami maps, uh, because now the global, um, you know, the G GIS and the sort of various forms of digital mapping of what lies under the ocean, what is atmospheric mappings, all of these mappings are almost necessary for us to better understand the implications for the, for the global south in terms of how the future of climate will impact us. So uh, I think the question is terrific and the answers are multiple, but yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think earlier I, I uh, <laughs> misspoke, I, I was a bit too excited. I wanted this to go for another like 15 to maybe another hour or so if we can. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're actually out of time and um, Nilifer had to remind me of that. So, um, we um, we are very happy to have everyone present here. Uh, we have uh, a very interesting conversation. There is one more question. I don't know if we can like quickly address that. And then uh, we have one more event that we would like to announce. Um, so this is a question from Jonathan Walsh. Uh, Walsh. Is there a danger in Indian Ocean's um, influences being applied in an uncritical way that would may erase African agency in relationship to the grand Indi Indian Ocean or pre-colonial or pre-literary past in relationship to recent and historical times? The pendulum, uh, pendulum will eventually swing back. Um, so if you want to take like maybe one minute each to answer this and then we'll end on this question. I hand it to my colleagues. It's a it's a tricky, and I I, I think Jonathan's work is is a great uh, counter to 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 my to to uh, he, yeah his work is is the answer to his question. It's it's wonderful work. So please respond. Um, I can say a little bit in terms of how it relates to my work, um, if that's okay with folks. 
Um, so I don't, personally, I don't see the Indian Ocean being at odds with African agency. I think Africans are incredibly agentive in terms of Indian Ocean histories, but also for me in terms of the scholarly work that I do. In fact, I find um, in terms of the intellectual arenas in which I share my work and in which I find my work most generously and generatively engaged are um, really like in Africa or in African literary and cultural studies spaces. Like South Asian literary studies by contrast has been very slow to think about Indian Ocean literary studies. So in that sense, I find the, the naming um, to uh, Professor Joseph's point about the, the linguistic map of the Indian Ocean as we currently use it um, to be really against the grain of, of the place that or in the questions that allow me to do my work. So I'm very much thinking about places in East Africa like Zanzibar, Dar es Salaam, Mombasa, um, mm -hmm. as well as Nairobi is shaping my work, but also um, South Africa, places like Durban, places like Johannesburg, Stellenbosch, and Cape Town, where I've shared my work and where I've done some archival research. Um, I don't, I don't know that this there's like a single answer that can be given, right? Because African agency shifts, um, the hegemony of the Indian Ocean shifts across time and space. So there's no one way to put it. Um, but I think I have most been influenced by scholars who are working in the African end of the Indian Ocean, if we were to say it. And my own work um, is deeply embedded in thinking about anti-Blackness in the context of East and Southeastern Africa, but also um, how it's pervasive in the Indian Ocean world, contemporary as well as historic. So in that sense, like my commitment um, is to not erasing African agency. Mira, if you wanna add something, one minute. That that um, Dr. Kadir's response is wonderful, and I mean, it's it's for me, it's actually a really um, provocative question to be thinking about. Just as I kind of continue to refine um, my own work and thinking about labor and um, carceral labor as it sort of moves across this region, and um, you know the ways that I approach that, telling that history and, and documenting that history. So for for me, more than anything, um, that's I, I think thank you for that question because it it's actually um, important as I become an Indian Ocean scholar to um, recognize in my own work and think about a little bit more deeply. So I'll just leave it at that. I, if I could just give a quick response as well, um, because Jonathan's point is 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 really key. Um, um, well, because I grew up in Tanzania and one of the tensions in, in East Africa, again, is the return of anti-Asian violence. So uh, I think, uh, I think uh, the issue that Jonathan raises about, uh, you know, is African agency, uh, in, is African agency um, sort of um, sacrificed in this Indian Ocean framework that we tend to emphasize. I think it's a very delicate balance and it's, and I think it's a highly contentious point uh, or, or series of, uh, of, of points. And I think it's being played out in Uganda as we speak actually in ways that are very tactile in terms of, you know, this kind of response of, they, they, that the Indian Ocean aspect of Uganda is being sort of under duress, is being threatened. Uh, same thing with Tanzania, you know, Asians become embody, embodiments of the Indian Ocean presence in ways that the Arab, um, you know, there's a Zanzibari presence has a different history. So he's, uh, Jonathan's right, and I don't have a good answer, but just to say it's, it's extremely uh, volatile, I think that question, uh, and I, I do like the way Jonathan's own work, which is deeply embedded in the mountains of Tanzania, and it's, it's, it's like years of research, is a different kind of work from the, the very, um, you know, the, the, the kind of work I'm doing. So, uh, yes, I think it's a real tension. Thank you um, for those answers. Um, so as we close on the series of Ashby Dialogue, we have one more event scheduled for this um, semester that we would like to invite you all. Um, so um, the, the detail is uh, available on your screen. You should be able to see it. So we have um, uh, Shalja Patel, the author of Migritude, among other works, is coming to, to speak virtually um, on campus. So as a poet, performer, and activist, she works on um, African women's leadership and contribution to enacting global um, climate justice. So she will adopt a historical and contemporary lens to the crucial issue and highlight how artists imagine and enact social change. So this event is scheduled for April 21st, uh, which is about three weeks away, uh, 4 p.m. kind of uh, following along with this um, slot timeline. Um, in the chat, Anilfer has also shared the um, 
linked for more detail on this um, webinar um, for registration on all of that. Uh, so Nila, if you want to say a couple more words on this. I think just to add that like Shoja Patel's talk um, will be followed by a live Q&A with the audience as well as a couple of questions from um, Dr. Gurma and myself and we look forward to seeing you there. Please invite anyone you like, it is open to all. Um, and we particularly hope to see students there. So once again, thank you everyone for attending this series of talks. We've had very engaging conversations and we hope that this is only the beginning um, of a very uh, fruitful relationships and collaborations and working together. So thank you all. Thank you so much, Hewan, Nila, Fur, and Omar. It's been a privilege. Thank you. It's been really wonderful. Just adding my thanks. And to our audience, we've had such a robust audience throughout. I'm really grateful for you all's presence. Mm -hmm. Yes. So happy Wednesday, everyone. <laughs> happy Wednesday. Thank you all. It's been terrific. Thank you, audience, as well. <laughs>